the opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Hi, it's Christine Joan Hart, and I'm pleased to be with you tonight. And it's the Full of Heart show. How do you like that for a new name? Uh, <laughs> I'm trying out so many different names to see which one works. Um, coming to you wherever you are, live from London, and it's a really bright evening. It, it's wet really but it's really really bright so it's nice that it's this late in the day and it's really really bright so it's coming into British summertime so I'm really really happy about that um I've had a really odd week this week so I've no guest um I'm going to share with you my week and what went on and then I'm going to read over some of the book I am working on which is based on what has been going on for me um, so that is what the show is going to consist of tonight. So I hope you'll stay with me um, during the two hours, the next two hours. Um, just to catch up on what's been going on, um, Mars Johnson has been, um, he's been ringing me all week and um, insisting on uh, me doing the um show he had a part three show with the um Aquino uh chap and he's done a part one and part two with the Colonel Michael Aquino uh person if anybody doesn't know who well, I'm sure everybody listening knows who's who that is and I was rather told off by a friend of mine who was like oh you you made my girlfriend interested in him and she googled him and then had nightmares well somebody told me about him <laughs> so it wasn't that super long ago it was like about Hmm. Is it about two years ago, somebody um, came to me after I'd written my book, In for the Kill, and told me I was a monarch and I'd been under mind control. And I completely thought, well, she must be mad. And from then, I went into a kind of started researching it and, you know, researching myself. And as things unfolded, a lot of things in in my life became pretty clear a lot of things that were confusing to me and there, there was a lot of clarity so that that was a good thing and um this same american woman um mentioned this colonel michael aquino guy and my ears pricked up at the time being a journalist and i found the name quite fascinating so i googled um this person and up came douglas dietrich of course um I think that's about all that comes up for him, really. Um, at the moment, there's not much online. I believe he took down a, a lot of stuff that was online. And uh, so I tracked down this Douglas Dietrich chap and um, talked to him and asked him about this monarch stuff and went on his radio show and became friends with him. He's no longer friends with me and he refuses to speak to me. So I don't know what I've done. Well, I do know what I've done. I just said to him that I was going to contact um, this Akina guy and have him on the show. So at that moment, he then stopped speaking to me. And this week I approached him to ask him a few questions about the things that Miles Johnson was talking to me about. And he refused to speak to me and you know, I thought it was kind of weird, a bit off, but, you know, fair enough. I just wanted to ask this one um, question, but, um, yeah, he refused to speak to me. So, whatever, I was going to swap some information, but, you know, I'm not just going to swap this particular information for nothing. Um, so, what what happened um, then, um, Dietrich told me about more about this monarch stuff and you know I was researching it and all the while I was thinking well maybe it didn't happen to me and of course it's a good thing if it didn't happen to you because it's kind of you know your life really to someone else's agenda and although part of me 
you know, friends who I talked to over with were like saying, well, it's just an excuse of being a loser. You know, you're one of these people that are, you know, you're a loser. You've kind of driven your car into a cul-de-sac and someone has to be a loser. Not everybody can be um, winners or be successful. Somebody has to end up, you know, living in a bed sit and um, not having anything or a career or anything. Um, so, you know, they were like, oh, it has to be you. So that's okay. You know, I don't mind that because uh, my ego had been worn away. The village where I lived, I moved in there. And just as I lost my job at the Sun, thanks to Nick Parker, who's still there. <laughs> Amazingly, he did a scam on Heather Mills and um, it didn't it crash badly. Heather then, um, I was given a dummy phone by Nick Parker and Heather then rang me and ripped into me and I stayed on the phone with her for half an hour or so and then she put it on her website. It's now gone from her website but the son um, sacked me for that even though I was just trying to be nice to her to calm her down because she realised that the fake emails were coming from the son and I thought I was doing the right thing but you know, I don't think it's the right thing to send fake emails. But Nick, even though he accepted um, a mobile phone, he's still at the sun. He's still on a high salary. Anyway, there we are. I mustn't be resentful about other people because I haven't got my job. Um, so I was in a village with a lot of women who had married well and they hadn't worked, but they'd married well. And of course, bought property a long time ago. So now we're in like two, three million property pound houses. And I was in a rented shack and it was very hard for me having an ego having worked for the news of the world for 10 years and the sun for six years and having an ego myself around that it was hard for me to lose my job and have those women sort of treat me as if I was a Tesco worker and oh look you're a single mother sort of have you got a position in Tesco yet and um, of course I was unemployed and you know it's almost like I felt like I had to speak differently like talk like eh, to sort of make them happy and sort of drop my eye trees and say oh we like and I almost felt like I had to walk funny like walk maybe as if I was you know not able to kind of walk properly and I just felt like that I felt really kind of odd and it made me look at my life and I spoke to somebody at the time and they said well you don't have to have a personality disintegration because you've lost your job but coming up against those women who were very queen bee and you know they left my son out of stuff as well it it was really hard and so my ego got shaved away and I gradually realized that, you know, I didn't have to have a personality um, disintegration. I didn't have News International to cling to, but I was still a person and I didn't need to, um, you know, talk funny to please them. They saw me in a typical way um, that those type of women see somebody who hasn't married they see you as bizarrely they see you as sex hungry which is kind of odd because they're the ones that have got married and have sex all the time I mean I haven't had sex in 12 years so but they look at you as if you're kind of a bit of a whore um and they look at you as if you're slightly retarded because you're rented and they've got the huge villas so it was really hard for me having them all mirror back that I was a certain like retarded whore and you know I had to kind of take it on board and it was really hard because I saw them at school drop off which was early in the morning and I was usually like knackered and really really sensitive I would have them look at me with those kind of mirroring that I was a retarded whore and then at three o'clock when um, I picked my son up from school I got the retarded whore kind of thing again and it it was really hard. I went through a really, really um, hard patch. But now looking back, it was probably um, building a certain amount of muscle. And I wrote a book during that time. Um, I probably shouldn't have done. But I spent what savings I had invested into doing that. And um, I wrote and wrote. And I wrote for about three, four years um, savings run out and I was really really struggling and I had was writing and writing and not getting what I was writing published and um, this eventually I got a book published and 
it made nothing. It, it just made absolutely zero. Um, that was by mainstream. And I think, I don't know how many copies it sold. It's still selling, but I didn't get anything for it because it took £6,000 to legal. And according to the publisher, it didn't make um, more than that last time I spoke to them. So that was a terrible flop and it took me a year to edit it working with the editor so it was massive amounts of work went in three years of work one year one uh, further year of editing and then I decided to write a novel and then spent another three years on a novel and it was kind of stupid because I got more and more into debt and the novel that I thought would make me money buy me a house it, it couldn't even get an agent so it was during all this time that this woman had come along and talked about this mind control and friends were saying well isn't that good that you can look back on your life and say oh it was mind controlled I was mind controlled and that's why I've ended up in a ditch and it wasn't really that because I think if you get your ego pummeled to death then you don't you kind of accept it you know um I think <laughs> as well um that I had been the one who set off the phone hacking for the news of the world and I was due to be a witness at the court case um later dropped by I think it's a CPS that when um someone that I thought was an ex-boyfriend Greg Miskew um pleaded guilty so I wasn't needed as my evidence was against him and um so I turned out that he wasn't an ex-boyfriend he had just came around and abused me but there we are that was what I thought at the time um and so I thought I was going to be a witness at this phone hacking trial and suddenly the trial went ahead and even though it was me that started the phone hacking by bringing in John Boyle and in introducing him to Greg Miskew that it started so I had this big backstory about John Boyle and the, the story about Miskew and how Miskew had s stolen his office worker um, who did the hacking and um, that he was trained to do by John Boyle and Greg Miskew stole him and, you know, paid him more money because John was paying him peanuts and yet I think charging him £5,000 per hack. And um, so Greg stole, the News of the World editor stole um, this Mr Big's office boy and then the whole thing I found out and then I went and told John and John, of course, told his pals in MI6 and the newspaper ended up burnt. Um, which is what John Boyle wanted. So I had this big story. And so I wrote it in a book and I thought it would get accepted by publishers, blah, blah, blah. And of course that crashed. Um, I even at the time had Tom Hardy's mother, Anne, um, who became a friend who was offering to write the screenplay for it with me. So that was all going on. And that just kind of turned to absolute nothing. So there was a sort of thing where I realized that I had nothing going on for me and um, for the past few years I've been in that position of realizing that I've got nothing going on and I suppose it's handy to look around and say well that's because I'm a monarch slave and I suppose I suppose yeah I suppose I would I would like that to be true, I suppose, rather than just looking in the mirror and thinking, wow, what a screw up, what a complete mess you made of your life. Um, just, it's handy to think, oh, it was because of this, this, this. Um, but I have to look at my sexuality that has been dormant for the past 12 years and look and see that the only points that that was active was around um, activities, certain activities like crashing the news of the world, um, getting the command of the real IRA into prison, um, these two um, other political, um, politically placed people that I had affairs with, that it it was my kind of sexuality that was my 
puppet string that kind of um that was how it was triggered so yeah so and then I came across Douglas Dietrich because this woman had mentioned this you know guy and I'd googled and up come came this American um Douglas Dietrich and so he had me on his radio show to interview me and um it was interesting because he was the first person that said to me, because I had visited serial killers in my life, and I felt very, very ashamed of it because I always felt the urge to get really, really close to them and find out why they'd done it. And I always wondered why. I mean, why does it matter why they've done it? Who gives a shit, really? Um, but I had this um, need to um, really, really get under their skin and, and find out. And I dirty because it firstly it had taken a long time um it's the main serial killers um there were others but the main ones were ian brady and kenneth bianchi and um because one was jeremy bamba he's not he's not noted as a serial killer but i would term as a serial killer because he shot his family so i had a lot of feeling of being dirty and it was douglas duch who said to me that that was part of um a mission and that it wasn't organic and it didn't come from me and I just felt a massive weight being lifted off my shoulders and it was like being seen for the first time and I just felt clean um so it was that that made me think and then of course when I went to Belfast and the fact that ideas used to just land with me all of a sudden there would be like oh the IRA and oh you know get a book and oh somebody sending me to um Belfast and all of a sudden I'd be up to my neck in the UDA or the UVF and all of a sudden I would be um writing stories and they would get on the front page of the news of the world or the front page of the Sunday Times and everything would run smoothly and I was earning a lot of money but it was just I was moving really smoothly through life and I kind of got used to living like that, that whenever I didn't know what to do, the idea would land fully formed inside my mind. And people thought I was rather clever. And then when it left me, it was just all at the same time when there was a massive kind of crash. Um, when that left me and I found myself living differently, it was like I didn't have that intelligence and the woman that came and told me about mind control said well that's a connection to the demonic because they know what's going on and it was really a psychic thing people used to ask me questions when I was working about investigations certainly from the news of the world oh check this out check that out and can you do this and I could always do it and sometimes I would sleep on it and then know in the morning and I, I knew it was clever, I knew it myself, and I knew it wasn't coming from me either. Um, but it just, I don't know, I didn't really question it. I just thought, oh, I'm like connected to something, and oh, was, you know, and I had that going on. And people called it my magic powers, and I guess it was really. And I guess they thought it was me. Um, and it was, it wasn't, it wasn't me. And it, that left me um, at this point when everything crashed, that intelligence, that connection, that magic, those powers left me. And according to this woman that contacted me, she said that that happens. And it's like um, being thrown from the freedom train. And I, I thought, well, if being a slave means the kind of life that I've had I would rather be a slave than just be some schmuck who's not connected and I realized that all through my life I had kind of had this guiding hand and kind of been told this 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 and I had moved through life with great ease with you know massive massive ease and to live without that is it's horrible it's like a death it's like being kind of mundane it's like not like a life and I always used to wonder why people built houses and 
you know, settled down and saved and got pensions. And I thought, where do they live like that? It's like so small. And now I see, because if you don't have that connection to the higher, then you need to do all those kind of little rabbity hutch things because you've only got, you've only got the rabbit hutch. You've only got that mundane world. You've only got the world that you can see. And it's quite a hard world to um, navigate in, bloody hard, when you haven't got all sorts of magic shit coming into your head, telling you do this, do that, to the other, and then walking along a golden pathway. And she told me probably if you were offered, you'd go back. And I thought, well, yeah, who cares if it's demonic? I don't care. I I would. And then slowly over a period of time I came to look back over my life and see that actually you know it's not right to live like that and it's not good and the I didn't really like it but all the money I earned I spent on you know I didn't invest or save or buy a house because I knew it was dirty money and I just kind of just didn't really want it and just bought you know, candy things like clothes and then I would just dump a load of clothes down Oxfam and then buy a load more and then dump them again and knickknacks and, um, yeah, just frittered really um, on nothing. But it was an easy life and you feel privileged and you live, I lived in really equal places and mixed with very, very powerful people, mixed with very, very dangerous people. And, um I really, really enjoyed it. And to find myself just being a normal person just crashed. And (laughs) I have to, you know, I'm not getting any ideas coming fully formed in my mind. Um, I'm just living like anybody else would. And I haven't built shit at my age like everyone else does. So it feels kind of weird to be in this position. And, you know, friends say to me, oh, you're a loser, you should face it and face you're a loser. And that mind control stuff didn't happen to you. And um, so so I, I, don't, I don't need it to have happened to me. I don't need it. I can face the fact that um, I'm a loser, but I do miss that magic. I do miss that connection to something. And I guess probably it was the dark side, but I miss that because it, makes you feel better than others it makes you feel connected to something that others aren't connected to and you do feel uh, powerful and um you don't have to have faith in god because you feel connected to the higher because you know it's not like god you just think well i am the higher and you know you you never fear life you don't have that fear because you can see everything you know and you know you'll be helped because you are the one that will help you because you're very very plugged in and to not be plugged in i mean i don't think there's i don't think there's a morning where i wake up and don't feel this sinking feeling of fear in my stomach of um what am i going to do for money what am i going to do for money i'm going to support my child where will we live where will we live will we end up on the street and that just goes round around my head and you know just feeling like I'm getting older and I haven't found a purpose here and it feels really really weird to have lived all those years and yet not built anything for myself nothing um no structure at all it's like nothing is there it's ashes and so that's what makes me think that the monarch stuff is true and you know another part doesn't want it to be true because you think well if it is I'm going to feel really really bitter and hard done by because there's no way that you can uh, get compensation for it. There's no way you can get your life back and then build a different kind of life where, you know, you've got something like you study and then have a career or this, this, this. You know, I've been, I spent years, I spent, what, four years getting close to Kenneth Bianchi, the Hillside Strangler, to find out why he did it, to get really um, in touch to him, to get invited to see him, to to be able to touch his skin and psychometrize him, which is what I did. And as soon as I psychometrized him, I remember seeing it and then just kind of downloading it. And that was it. Just bang. It was finished. No more interest. And, you know, getting close to the real IRA, that took 
God, how long did that take? That took five years. That took five years of um, just completely ringing, ringing, ringing um, their political party and, you know, kind of going to meetings, forging contacts, having the contacts tip you off about this meeting and that meeting. And, you know, that that in itself is massive. And then, of course, the UDA and that is massive, massive work. And I should have something for that rather than nothing. It should have been for a reason and it wasn't for a reason. So it's like all those years of all that work and it wasn't just a few hours work it was every hour of every day was put into that was put into thinking acting one step closer one step here do this do that and yeah that's a lot of that's a lot of years that's a lot of life that's a lot of effort and just to end up um as if i'm a migrant just coming over from syria which is position i'm in i i i don't really know what to do how to support myself and you know because what i was was a spy basically i was a spy i mean i can spy but nobody wants me because um i also function as a journalist but am i trained as a journalist i can go out and journalize no i'm not i suppose you can do it but my name is mud with a lot of the news editors so I'm really screwed and so I'm applying for jobs that every migrant is applying for um, but I'm sure there's other people in that position but anyway um, Mars Johnson said to me that he was going to interview this um, this Aquino guy and um, I had had this experience where I had emailed him and asked to um, I think was it to interview himself to Douglas Dietrich sorted me out this radio show and said it's a good idea if you have a radio show and share about yourself i don't know is it a good idea i'm not sure i'm not sure that douglas ever meant me well everyone used to say he doesn't mean you well and i kind of think so i, I don't think a real friend just ups and doesn't speak to you for no apparent reason and then acts as if you're a leper so um i think all the friends that warned me and said he's really bad and he's just out to do abc whatever abc d is um i think that they were probably right about that so um that's okay but it probably means that this is harming me in some kind of way sharing it's probably lots of horrible people out there who absolutely hate me who um I'd be like, oh, look, listen, she's mad. Oh, listen, she's sharing her madness. Well, I'm not sharing madness. I'm sharing about life and the purpose. I mean, basically, my peers are headed towards death. And we haven't got much longer to go. And time goes really, really fast before we are the crone. And then we go to dust. So I want to find out why I'm here. So if that's mad, then fine. Um, I'm not stating anything in concrete. I mean, their lives too. I think we're all someone in the different layers, you know. I mean, I had a friend and I've got a friend, but I think that she is something that is opposing to me, but not in this physical reality, in the other upper layers. I just get the feeling of that. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, but I do get the feeling I've become awake and aware to other layers, um, whatever you want to call them, other different um, higher consciousness, which is where we go after death. So to concentrate on that certainly isn't mad, but it's sometimes necessary, certainly in the times we live in now where terrible things are happening in this 3D um, so anyway, back to the Aquino person. One second, please. So I had um, I had emailed this Aquino chap and he then, I think everyone knows the story about how he appeared to me as a white rabbit and then led um, a part of me off down a rabbit hole and then offered me um, these certain powers if I climbed inside this shape. I keep seeing the shape on Facebook, actually, bizarrely enough. Um, it's kind of a shape within a shape where you can um, climb inside. So I then didn't have any more contact with this person because I was 
very afraid because he pulled me out of my body for about a week and so I had continuous consciousness and I hadn't had I'd had continuous consciousness maybe on the odd night but it was always quite an exhilarating experience where I'd traveled um different layers and had you know met different entities and really quite enjoyed it so in the morning you know I was in a euphoric state so one wasn't thinking about oh you know I haven't slept um but when he pulled me out of my body it was quite a nightmare experience because I was seeing horrible visions of dolls and marionettes and children stuck behind these marionettes and just horrible stuff from childhood and really bad stuff from childhood and um yeah it was awful and I thought I'm not going to get near that person what a terrifying person and clearly they're an adept which is what people say yeah so I'm not going to rattle that person's cage again and indeed it was someone I didn't know um but a lot of Americans are more clued up than I am on who who that person is I wasn't super clued up on who that was who he actually was but I am now I've come to know and believe what people say about his um occult powers which are really really strong um so Miles Johnson um did an interview with him recently part one and part two and he I then did a show last week talking about him with some Christian um, ministers and then he came to me despite me doing the show um, about that which I rather thought drew a line under everything um, for me anyway and he then said oh you must come on part three with Aquino and and front him up about monarch and what your experience with him and so <laughs> I didn't want to I really didn't want to because I had been trolled quite a lot I've been trolled by one person saying that I'd had astral sex with him no I hadn't I shared with Douglas Dietrich about luring him to me after the attack it was weeks after when I thought right I'm going to come for you you came for me I'm going to come for you so I imagined him and I tried to lure him towards me um, by making my body sexual which you can in the astral and by making it sexual I mean it wasn't this body I've got which I don't think I could lure many many men with my body um, because it's kind of a little bit like a jelly baby body <laughs> but so I made it look attractive and um, tried to lure him then when he got close to me I grabbed him around the neck and squeezed it and um, asked him where where the keys were so it's a lot different um, from what these trolls said so get it right but then you know there's insanity going on um with those trolls so i had that and some woman um also um trolling me really terribly and then saying awful things but you know i had been used to it because i had it before um with people that that know miles johnson actually and so anyway miles said to me oh you have to do it so I said, I didn't really want to, actually. I just don't want to, um, because he's all the mad tide of um, trolls. I said, just can't be bothered with it. And um, because to face someone like that, you have to be strong. And if you're being attacked so venomously and demonically, then you can't gather the energy necessary to um face someone demonic because you're already being demonically attacked and then of course if you um attack someone like him on air then he will come for you afterwards as well so I, i'm sure he would take anything as an attack so i really don't care for that because what happens when you go off to sleep you um find yourself not drifting off but just going into someone else's ship which is almost like someone's taking the remote for your mind off you and they've they've got the control which I really don't like especially if you're tired it's bloody awful um so I didn't really want to confront him and then Miles kept ringing me and saying to me um wow such a beautiful sunset here in London um saying to me that I had to do it and I was letting people down and shouting at me and you know don't you care the world's going to shit you don't contribute to it and which kind of triggered me and I thought well yeah I suppose I'm not contributing to it 
and so I said, oh, I will then. And then um, a friend of mine, Paul, who's another um, host, I mentioned it to him and he then rang Miles and then he threatened Miles. And then Miles said to me, oh, it's okay. You don't have to do it. And then I said, oh, because I would have done. And then he went, okay, well, do it then. And <laughs> I kind of was quite funny almost. I kind of got suckered in again. And um, in the end, I emailed Aquino and um, said, Miles wants me to come on this show and to um, talk to you about Monarch Mind Control. And, you know, I'm going to do that. I'm just going to talk about my story. And and that's that. You know, I just felt really drained over the whole thing. I thought I really didn't want to do this. And then he, this was, was it yesterday or the day before? I can't. Gosh, I can't remember. I think it was the day before yesterday. And then Miles had emailed um, Aquino and said something. And then Aquino emailed me and said um, this long email. And I sent it to Fritz Springmeier, actually. Um, I sent it to a few people because it really upset me. People said, you know, beware, you'll get triggered. I was actually triggered by... Miles Johnson's interview, there was bits in it that Keno had said, um, let me take you through the looking glass. That triggered me and loads of other stuff. There was other bits in there that triggered me and, um, but not so much, you know, I just felt kind of weird. Um, and then um, other people had come to me and said, you know, they'd had nightmares, blah, blah, blah. And I kind of felt weird because Mars has got together a group of survivors um, from Monarch and other things. And then he's put <laughs> the person that, that, you know, does that kind of thing. It almost felt like a cat in the hen house or something like that. It felt as if something really weird was going on, actually. Um, <coughs> and, you know, I just thought, gosh that's weird and I just thought of all the bad things that happened to people like Max Spears was murdered and James Caswell went to prison for many many years and I just felt kind of weird and um so Aquino had written me this long email and said oh if you have fantasies and it's another person accusing me of fantasies really annoyed me actually um if you have fantasies about that kind of thing um something something i can't remember you know obviously um you know deluded or some some something insulting like that um uh, that people like that often by that i mean trolls people troll trolling you you know like you have the only fantasy i have is mickey rourke nothing else okay nothing else trolls remember mickey rourke okay nothing else so anyway he kind of trolled me in this email oh your fantasies about monarch <laughs> you know um and this doesn't exist. Oh, you know, there was no such thing. Um, you probably mean the Mancurian candidate where Lawrence Stone and he sits at the table. He turns over a card. When he turns over the card, it's the Queen of Hearts. And I was reading this rather long email. And when I got to that bit, he turns over the card sees the queen of hearts it was like oh it's just can't really whew, i can't really describe what happened oh i still feel winded by it it was like it was like my whole body went to ice in like a second just as i read it, it was like uh, and it was like a part of me that wasn't me reacting to it you know because it wasn't like my conscious mind said oh like that and I took it in it was like I was just reading and then part of me it's almost like you're driving a car and somebody else goes slam and slams the brakes on you're like whoa and you're all of a sudden you're going into a skid but you like that wasn't me that slammed the brakes on kind of thing and it was like that effect on my whole body went to peace and <coughs> That was horrible. And I stopped reading 
because I couldn't read on. I was like in a car that was spinning and I started really shaking. My whole body started shaking, but I was shaking because I was cold. But it was a mixture of fear and cold. So I don't know whether it was more like I was like, <sighs> my teeth were chattering, even though I was in a room and I was in a at my gym and in the part where you sit and um I was shaking and my teeth like that rattling and my hands were shaking and it was fear and cold fear and cold both and then I started crying like again not really consciously crying it just sort of came out like a kind of a kitten kind of like that crying and oh it was horrible I don't think I'll ever forget that um and I went outside I thought what what shit's going on and I was really scared and I went outside and I walked around and um I just walked up and down and the sun was shining and I just walked walked up and down and I thought what's going on and then I remembered people saying oh don't talk to him he'll trigger you and I thought I've probably been triggered that's what's happened. And I rang Miles crying. I said, he's triggered me. And then he said, oh, you must do this interview with him and find out what all this is about. And I just hung up on him. I thought, he didn't really care about me very much. because I felt so horrible. And um, I was talking to a friend on um, Facebook Messenger. He um, calmed me down thank goodness oh that was horrible um it was absolutely horrible I sent him the email I sent it to Fritz Springmeier as well he said Fritz Springmeier said you say he's triggered a part and you say to that part stand down now you've done a good job but now it's time to come home <laughs> so I was saying that well, I was shaking and shivering and my teeth were chattering. I, 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 that's why I, I, I said to myself, um, ah, it was weird. Um, that was weird. Just this ice. And I didn't really read the rest of that email. It was long, but I didn't read it. I just didn't want to. What else is in there? And I just wondered how could somebody do that you know how can they do that and it was odd because I'd called my show Queen of Heart show and I like Alice in Wonderland I like the um Alice in Wonderland things I've got an Alice in Wonderland tea set and um I brought a few of the dolls when they came out from the Disney store I really enjoy that kind of shit you know I, I just couldn't wait till the film came out I sort of did cartwheels all the way to get there. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a real fan of um, that. So it just seemed like really to have that really weird effect. Um, and um, Miles said I had to come on the show and to talk to him to face it. So I was in this garden pacing up and down. And it's like I kind of remembered... I know it's going to sound like weird and like, oh, she's making it up. No, I'm not making it up. Um, I haven't got long in this life, so I'm trying to do something good because <laughs> God knows I haven't done anything good with my life um, so far. Uh, so I'm trying to maybe help people out there or, or shine a light on this. So, yeah, I had the image of going into an icy bath like an ice water and the phrase go to ice and it's weird because I always called that part of me that I couldn't reach ice and I always said that it was really really cold um and the kind of there was a kind of command go to ice and go to ice was preparation for something um and that's all I got but just this image of being in an ice 
or being um almost like on that film um there's a movie oh, there's a movie what is it called oh yes long kiss good night i don't know if any of my listeners have seen it where there's a girl and she's a school teacher and she uh she she i think the program is about monarch the film is about monarch i'm not sure i have to watch it again but this girl goes as put on a um wooden spinner and she's tied to it and they make her go underwater as a torture and she goes under it felt almost like that kind of thing that sort of under and then up again that kind of um like someone was putting me underwater but not on a wheel like that putting me underwater and then up again and then down again and then up and then down and loads and loads and loads of fear so much fear um so it scared me very very much and then I rang Miles and he was like well you've got to confront him I mean do you feel like confronting someone who can do that to you (laughs) not really because it's like I mean you know, ooh, what, what am I going to say? What's the really powerful person going to say as I'm crying and shaking, you know, to the person who can do that really easily? I mean, oh, I don't believe it. Anyway, Miles kept saying, oh, you must confront, you must do this, you must do it. I said, I can't. No, what are you going to do? Don't you care about people? Don't you care about humanity? You're not doing anything. So I then said, okay, that I would. And I said, I will do the show and I'll confront him. So um, it was the following day because I couldn't do it right away. I sent an email to Akina and said, I'll I'll talk to you on the show about Monarch, um, etc. And then he replied to me again and said that anybody that believes in Monarch programming or Alice in Wonderland or anything to do with that is crazy and insane. It's utter garbage. Satanic ritual abuse is garbage. It never happened. It's been proven that people that believe that are deluded, Ms. Hart. And um, I'm not going to go on air with you um, with these silly fantasies. Oh, God. I think he's ganged up together with my trolls um so i just responded doing a quick i said that's fine um you know fine you know you don't want to sort of end on a bad note with someone like that so i said don't worry that's fine with me um and then i went back and said to miles he didn't want to do it with me and i was kind of relieved but it's weird because i don't know what miles can do to me but miles was like oh okay then and i just finally felt this like pressure from miles you know this kind of pressure like it kind of abated and I kind of felt relieved um because I was on the verge of asking um Paul again to speak to him (laughs) but then I didn't think that was fair because I don't really want him shouted at um but I kind of wanted him just to like to back off because he doesn't really have um an awareness around how dangerous how dangerous um that person can be um and how they're not going to tell um what's going on he's a lewis carroll denier you know it's like he doesn't believe in any of that and normally maybe i would think okay i'm just a big big loser and my life's a big scribble because I'm an idiot and I lived like an idiot and um so I just made loads and loads of mistakes doing everything I did was a mistake and um I got a face I'm an idiot I'm just gonna die um confused and there's no such thing as those programs and then these things happen and like that triggering you know I mean I can't forget that and I can't sweep that under the carpet and I can't because it was so real and quite frankly if I've got anything like that inside me I just want to get it out you know I don't want um I don't want anything that's not organic inside me and 
so I was reading, I was Googling and I was reading, I was trying to um, read Queen of Hearts, what it means. I don't know if any of my listeners might know what it means. If they do, thanks. I'd really like it if you could enlighten me. I don't know how he managed to um, have that effect on me just by saying, turning the card in that moment on the film. I mean, I've seen the film years ago. It didn't affect me. So how come him saying it affected me? Um, it was really creepy. It's like it didn't affect me. It affected a certain part of me. Like It's just like you're driving along in a car on the motorway going really fast and some other foot comes in and slams on the brake. It's like that. It's really horrible. I, it just gives me the horrors, actually, to think about it and just to have this water, this ice water um, stuff. I'm going to be sick now, actually. Um I really feel sick because I felt sick since then. And I was moved to buy some an ANA perfume. It was quite expensive. Well, it's 25 quid. I didn't really have 25 quid to slop around, but I really felt like um, an ANA perfume. And I haven't had it since I was at school, about 12. Everybody had an ANA apart from me because um, our family were poor. But I just went and bought a bottle because I really just wanted to, to like smell it, just breathe it in. I really crave for it. Um, so I've got a bottle of it. And, um, yeah, um, and actually I've been, the book I wrote on Monarch, um, I sat and read it back today and realized that a lot of it is crap. Um, and it's crap because it's not really a novel. I'm using my own experiences and mixing them in and trying to work out what's going on with me at the same time. And it doesn't really a novel make you know so it's quite hard to oh we're going to break so it's fantastic i'll see you back in five minutes Opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Oh, hi, this is Christine Joan Hart <clears throat> back um, back with you, coming live from London. And quite an emotional show tonight. I didn't intend it to be, but um, just showing earlier, I had a little cry in the break. Um, I just felt like a, a doll, um, just a doll. I just felt like a little sad doll. And um, I just had a cry of self-pity. <laughs> Um, oh, I feel really exhausted. I feel better after a little um, in self-indulgent cry, but um, actually don't. I feel quite heavy around the chest area. I really do. I feel quite um, just really blocked up. That um, it's a weird feeling because I do. I've done primal therapy and I do know how to get to my feelings, but um, yeah, they're not not there really um i met up with a friend yesterday who 
insisted on going to get fish and chips from somewhere and the fish stunk horribly and she sat and ate it in my car and the car stinks really of bad fish and it won't leave so it's been kind of almost like stuck in my head um the smell and so um sort of I, I don't know I just I feel really um so if I need a wind to blow through me and I haven't been able to have that refreshing wind I before the show I had a bath in um Epsom salt and I just felt gosh it was cleansing and I just felt I needed to clean 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 more you know I took some bark flower crab apple and I do feel better I have to say I do feel better um it's interesting the way we clean our houses um we don't do energy cleaning and it's really important to you know if clothes are you know if you've had a bad time when you're wearing a dress and even if it's not dirty you think oh it can last another day you know wash it because you're washing out the energy if you put it on the following day it will still have the energy um also if you've had a good time wearing a dress you know leave it up put it on the next day because you're going to collect that energy so i have um just done a cleanse with salt and i do feel a lot um a lot better um yeah so interesting um so so that is that is my experience and you know i i was looking today i was looking on the internet to find out about monarch you know i studied it before i read fritz's book i've interviewed people on the show but really um and also is in a group with other women that have been through it and the bottom line is it was taught to us by the fallen angels and um it's a kind of black shamanism um there's keys codes triggers and i still don't understand the whole thing i don't understand the whole thing and if i am a victim of that which it looks a little bit like it then i just want that out thanks very much um i need to get on with the rest of my life by getting on i need to make money and um support my family i don't have a man supporting me so i need to make money and I, I obviously one can't make money if one has residual shit left over um someone else is setting up home um in my consciousness and um so i need to get that back i need to clean it and so i was looking on the internet different things deprogram alice in wonderland monarch and there's absolutely nothing <laughs> for you know something that people there's a lot of people explaining it in in your basic terms and you kind of look and they have these wonderful headlines you know like monarch explained in depth and you think oh and then you read it it's just same old same old same old same old i think we know to a certain point and then we don't know any more um we really don't know anymore and it is frustrating i suppose there's people out there that, that do see it with clarity but they're not sharing it with me i would appreciate it if they did share it with me but they're not sharing it with me um i seem to find it easy to fall out with just about everybody i know i can be rude sometimes when i'm angry um i do have a lot of resentments you know um and if someone triggers a resentment then of course you know i'm rude and so i i i know i've many enemies out there especially in these sort of communities of survivors you know lots of and then enemies of people that don't like me because um they think oh you're here for this agenda and that and i haven't got an agenda the only thing i want to do is look after my family I, I, that is the bottom line really i don't really want to save the world i'm not miles johnson and i haven't got any ambitions for myself anymore they're not going to come true i did have did have ambitions to write and they're not going to come out so i don't have them anymore and i don't really have any ambitions for myself i just want to make sure that my family is okay i don't care if i suffer anymore just as long as my family don't suffer so that's my bottom line in this um world um i'm stuck in at the moment and 
to make me able to function as a wage earner, I need to make sure my mind is is um, clear and operational. And for me, and I was reading today um, that the monarch programs is a form of brain damage and I, I thought yeah that, that kind of makes sense it's always felt as if um i was driving around in a mini when really it should be a much better car and people say oh you've done this 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 but it's not really I, i've got a bigger capability and i always felt like you know i park in disabled spots because i think I should, I deserve to park in a disabled spot. It's because I've got this like damage that I know I've got it, but other people can't see it because they think, oh no, you're all right. But I think, no, I should have done things. And yet I'm like the sort of, you know, um, retarded, you know, and I know people, people treat me like that. I had a friend, same friend with the fish and chips who said to me the other day, oh, you're my, my cousin. She's got a cousin who's retarded. <laughs> And um, she's called Susie and Claire. And she's like talking to me the other day. She goes, so you really remind me of Claire. You know, I know Claire's retarded. So I'm like, oh, your cousin who's retarded? <laughs> the one who's like mental age of three. Um, I she went, no, 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 you're not like her. But she, you like her in some ways though. I was just talking about someone who's retarded. You know, I mean, I've written books, yeah. Um, so I'm like, oh, okay. She goes, no, you're a child like. And kind of annoys me that people you know have that edge on me that I have got this damage and I'm not really um I'm not firing on all four I mean would someone who's firing on all four I know Heather Mills for example would anyone say that to Heather Mills I mean they just wouldn't um she's a bit kick-ass maybe it's the wrong person but you know a fully formed woman just wouldn't get that said to them I get things like that said to me um but they can do that because I've got this damage. It has done some kind of damage and, and some of it I can't even see. But I want to be, need to be, to earn money fully functional and whatever it takes to get there, I will get there. But I was looking on the internet and there's absolutely nothing about what to do um, if you've had this shit done to you. Absolutely nothing. Um, there was one guy who talked about something called Fabian Technique. Um, and I was reading his stuff and then he's written a book. Um, he's written a few books. Um, he's called something like Kiba. And then he was made to be a girl when he was younger and he was called Kathy. And I read, oh, I read one of his books today. It was so dark. It was so profoundly dark that maybe that's why I needed to wash and salt so bad. Oh. It was just awful. And this guy, obviously, he suffered so much. Um, I thought, It'd be nice to have him as guest on the show. And then I thought, I can't handle it. I mean, just because his story is dark, it's just so dark. And the stuff that he knows about these societies and they reach up to aristocracy and he knows all about it. And he, I was just reading it and why these people are in these societies. And it's just debauchery and sort of mor oh, just lack of morals and just all these things that, when I was reading Isaiah in the Bible, that the God said, you know, you'll be punished for them. But, you know, there are certain humans here that don't want to do that kind of um, thing. But there are a whole host of people that do want to do these kind of things. They do want to have sex orgies with loads of people. They do want to do that. They do look at pornography. They do um, want to have power over other um people they are like that and it's our leaders that are like that and they're causing all this shit so actually everything this guy was saying was true but it was really hard because he really knows a lot about it so i was reading it and it was just oh just it's too much to read all at once because it's it's absolutely horrible it's like satan really has come to earth really you know and Sometimes I feel like I wish I was like one of those people that didn't know shit and just, you know, watched telly and had their little house and their little husband and, you know, baked cakes and, you know, because it must be nice to not have to 
look at the darkness because it's not just black it's real deeper it's real deeper it's real awful and this guy um Kibo is he called I really can't remember his name um I doubt he was listening um to this I'm feeling that he's dead and I don't know why um he's clearly very clever the book was brilliantly written I'm not going to say the title of it because the title of it was so ugly um but it's it's out there it's 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 out there um and it was a horrible story and oh god it was a horrible story and um he was talking about the sphinx and how he was talking about cannibalism Ugh. um that was a title of one of the books he's written and one was called angelic demonic or something like that and um seemingly his aristocracy get into that because they believe that the egyptians worshipped the lion and because the lion ate people and they thought it was above them in the food chain so the sphinx was a cat or was it a cat and had the body of a lion or the head of a Egyptian then the body of a cat or something like that and then these aristocracy that this guy knew they got into that sort of cannibalism stuff because they thought it made them above other people well I'm gonna be sick now um and it was horrible this book it really was horrible um oh, I don't know I know the poor guy wrote it to get it out of his system but sometimes sometimes it's horrible to read and I found myself reading it, found myself wishing that I could help that person and wondering after you've seen that kind of depravity that just deserves to be just completely wiped off the face of the earth, wiped off everywhere, destroyed completely, um, that he, you know, how could he go on living? Because he can't go on living. It's really hard when you're here if you've seen lots and lots of darkness to then just live well you can't just live a sort of Disney life you have to I suppose then have a really massively strong connection to Christ really really massively strong and a really really strong connection to God where you just literally talk to God daily and you be with God um, daily but um, that's difficult because in this world God has kind of been banished I and mean, it's not really in existence really for us um, and he was talking as well about um, Satan and Lucifer and seemingly Lucifer is Ishtar who's a goddess that makes sense because the evil that's here at the moment I remember Max talking about the negative feminine um, the dark energy here at the moment it's incredibly malicious um you can just feel it in the air it's a charge of maliciousness so i don't know if that's coming from the ishtar um entity and the other one is baal um who they used to worship uh, back in the ancient days and i believe they worship now well clearly um this person knows everything there is to know I would say about that kind of dark fraternity and it was quite interesting what these um, aristocracy globalists what what they want and they just live in a sort of awful way where you just think oh, they just they're not actually human I suppose not in the real way that we were made and we are supposed to be like with hearts and everything they're just about wanting power i suppose and and sex and depravity not connected with spirituality or love at all just a lost charge which is actually evil if it's not connected to love not at all and we all see good looking men like um who's that guy in the walking dead the southern one with the southern accent who rides that chopper we can all see someone like that and think, oh gosh so nice love to kiss him you know but it's that's okay to just like but if you start like looking at pornography and you know all that kind of just sex with strangers it's wrong it's bad because it is a foot a, a foot step 
on that road that those people are on. Okay, they're right at the end of it, but you're still putting a footstep on it. So, yeah, it's okay to have a passing thought. You know, if you're watching program, that guy on this gorgeous got the chopper, um, stunning, so strong. Oh, and um, but you know, if you sort of, it's okay to sort, of, but you start thinking like thoughts constantly, or you know, lusting thoughts. It's not right because it's supposed to be in a love relationship. That's what I believe, anyway. Um, to connect with your humanity. Um, so I spent my day looking at that and thinking, would it be good to have as a guest? I suppose it would be um, interesting to speak to him, but I don't know if I um, can cope with, with what he's been through. I don't know if I... I thought I'd seen a lot of darkness, but... a oh, poor man. I actually hope he's dead. That's horrible, but... Who can just walk and see all those people like that and sort of go on living? This has become a priest or something or prays all the time. I really, I think I'll pray for him later. I can't remember his name. I could Google it, but I really actually don't want to lead everyone else to go and look for the bloody thing because I don't want them to to um, feel as I do right now. Um, anyway, so we have plenty of time left for the rest of the show. So I am going to read through um, my book, which is um, I... Um, writing it and it's I'm writing it as a novel why I'm writing it as a novel is because try selling a book about monarch mind control to the publishers the mainstream publishers they just don't want it why they don't think it exists a bit like Colonel Aquino it doesn't exist and anybody that believes it exists must be a nut and having fantasies so um, I am doing a novel um, so, yeah, I'm going to read from it the first couple of chapters because I don't have a guest and I really can't talk anymore. <laughs> I've just talked myself to death and I feel quite exhausted actually now, but I kind of feel a bit better. It's kind of nice sometimes to um, <sighs> to talk. Um, OK, so chapter one. In the beginning was a father. Now, I hope my listeners, if you can kind of um, get yourself in a snuggly position and um, get a biscuit, a cup of tea, and I'll try and be like an audio book. And I'll try and make this as entertaining as I can. I'll read it with feeling. And I hope you enjoy. So, chapter one. In the beginning was a father. As a child, Nick's adoptive father would fly out with her to Dublin and stay in the small, slummy terraced house where he had grown up. Seven brothers and sisters made up the underprivileged Catholic family. His older sister was a senior nun inside the Order of the Daughters of St. Paul, and she was head of the family. Sister Kathleen had real power. Nick admired her grace and her knowledge of the Bible, a tension that was dripped down on her on visits to the convent with pasta, Italian ice cream, and chocolate biscotti. Sorry, I'm just going to add in that word. Chocolate. The only one of her father's family to stay at the terrace in Dublin to nurse their blind mother was Frances. Oh, God. Hang on. Sorry. She had white hair, a quick smile, yet had never married. Sorry. Yet had never married. She was beautiful, and Nick adored Francis. Sorry, adored Francis. Kenneth Fort Mount Brown. Sorry, Mount Brown. Kenneth Fort Mount Brown near the yeast-smelling Guinness factory was an adventure. Was an adventure playground. Sorry, God, spaz. Adventure playground. It was a rough, slummy neighbourhood, and its rawness appealed to something wild in Nick's nature. Sorry, don't know who we're talking about there. Nick's nature. Next door lived a part gypsy family called the Dunnings. Actually, this is true. It's taken from my life, um, and the Dunnings lived next door to actually where my father lived, and they had a boy. Um, called Val Dunning, who I had a crush on, and I got a kiss off of. And Val Dunning, if you're out there, 
my feelings are still the same. <laughs> no, not really. He was so stunningly beautiful. Did I have a crush? Or did I have a crush? I had a super crush. Um, the Dunnings had a washing line full of grey, piss-stained sheets. Yeah, they did. I hope, God, he could sue me, couldn't he, if he's listening to this. What do you mean? I had piss-stained sheets. We didn't have piss-stained sheets. We were a decent farm wire. Okay, the Dunnings had a washing line full of grey, piss-stained sheets and ten dirty, ragged kids spilling out of their fetid, stinking terrace. I really hope they're not watching. If anybody knows them, please don't contact them and tell them about this. I could just, should change their name, but never mind. Nick's moody adoptive brother, Peter. Hope you're not listening, Michael. Peter was terrified of the Dunnings, particularly fearing their eldest Val. Yes, you did, didn't you? I hope my brother's not listening. He did actually announce to me when we were having an argument, you've got a radio show going out across the world. Well, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't even think anyone listens, you ass. <laughs> he brought that up when we had an argument. Can you believe it? Who does that? Brings up, you've got a radio show as if it's like some kind of, you know, you've got herpes, you know. Oh, asshole. Anyway, okay, let's hope he's not listening. Well, you can hear about yourself, can't you, Michael? But you've called Peter in my book, okay? Yeah, I'm going to read that again. Nick's moody adoptive brother, Peter, was terrified of the Dunnings. <laughs> yeah, remember? Remember when we were children? You were scared of them. Yeah, you were. Particularly fearing their eldest, Val. Yep, you were. An angel-faced tearaway whom Nick was obsessed with. I certainly was. Nick was fascinated by the scummy family. They could really sue me. <laughs> by the scummy family and watch their stained bed sheets smelling a purse billowing. I put billowed. It's really bad grammar. Billowing in the wind. Soon as she got up in the morning and went out to the backyard to play. Old Mrs. Dunning was fat and smoked and always wanted to talk over the wall with a fag hanging out the side of her lipstick, lipstick slutty lips. I haven't put that. I'm just adding that now because it adds a bit of colour, doesn't it? She's probably dead by now, so it doesn't matter. Hello, Nick. How's your mother? Oh, good, Mrs. Dunning. She thinks you're the dirt on her shoe, Mrs. Dunning. That's in brackets. That's what I'm thinking yeah okay. <clears throat> and your daddy oh good too mrs dunning and he would probably like to buy you new tight knickers and watch you twirl nick that's in brackets too because that's what the girl's thinking yep nick noticed something mesmerizing in the woman's rich emerald aisles that's a little it's a little hint there she was rich although she was poor yeah and her heart involuntarily swelled with need and her throat choked up for want of, oops, just writing it as I go along here, a want of the maternal. So, like, Nick didn't have a mother. Yeah, okay, got that. Her father's mother was old and blind. It would sit by an unlit fire watching the hot coals. Hang on, sorry, I'm just adding bits. Watching the hot Coals. In baking hot August weather, she was still sat wrapped in a red woolly shawl, her grey head tilted, listening to the endless and mumbling nonsensical prayers. Wow, I'm such a bitch when I read out that. Nana was a lump of a granny, never speaking or smiling, only noisily sipping endless cups of sugary milky tea to lift her dreary dead life of isolation. <laughs> Her dinners were frozen pastry wrapped around salmon that stunk like my friend's goddamn fish in my goddamn car yesterday. Or lukewarm boil in a bag cod with dark green garden peas devotedly shelled at the sink by Francis. Francis, the ass. The house had a Sunday best front parlour full of plastic flowers barred to all. It had a cold outside toilet that smelt of lemon bleach with no loo roll, but after her father had sat in there for hours, the seat was warm and it smelled of bear shit that part of her felt comforted by. The outdoor lav overlooked a square cement garden where Nick played all alone each day because her brother was an owl. Nick loved the dreamy dark grey stone tenements of Dublin at night, the nearby seaside at Dolly Mount. And the blue, I can, sorry, I can fit in a word there, can't I? That garish. 
a garish dolly mount and the blue gated guinness factory leaking the aroma of yeast and malt just before it rained young nick felt at home in aunt francis's backyard not francis's lonely backyard yeah i was lonely as a child had no friends a bit like now lonely backyard with the green wet nettles on the edges of the concrete that attacked her bare tanned legs red and sore as she played made up games of imaginary friends yep do that now on one visit one sticky hot summer's day in late july val dunning cornered her out front it was such a boiling day and the sun was heating up everything far too hot she was almost breathless at the closing of his thick golden hair reeking of dust from the plantation do you want me do you want to kiss me i know you do nick i can sense you're hungry for me He was vulgar and smelted. He was so raw, she melted. <laughs> Done. Her heart beat fast as he pushed his fat lips against hers. She felt tight between her legs and inability to breathe. She pushed her tongue back hard into his warm mouth. Part of her remembered seeing Deborah Kerr underneath Bert Lancaster kissing hard and the surf on the beach in a movie she tossed her hair back and imagined herself as Deborah Kerr and he was a handsome but mad Bert Lancaster I want to marry you Nick spewed excitedly when he withdrew leaving a line of spittle still joining them she thought of his stinky sheets and felt wild and free with the idea of his body touching hers nestled up in their dirty grey piss stains he jumped on the back of his bike and rode off across the red wreck she turned towards the house and could smell eggs frying in the tiny kitchen. A deeper sniff brought the fecal stink of the many outdoor toilets and bad plumbing. Inside the house, Frances' delicious fried eggs were sizzling in the pan and made her mouth water. Nick ate greedily and went up to bed feeling sick. Yeah, okay. Thanks. It was late August and it had been a long, sticky, sweltering summer and she was golden from the heat wave with a spatter of freckles across her Roman nose. Nick, are you in bed already? I'm coming. Let's do that accent. Nick, you're in bed already. I'm coming up myself now. Get ready. Nick was 13 years old and often curled up cosily with her father in Ireland. Daddy in the double bed that used to belong to his parents. The front bedroom had a three-way mirror that she loved to sing in front of with a hairbrush, enjoying the three images and pretend to be a triplet singing threesomes or... Singing what? Singing like... Singing like... One of the three degrees. Bet you by golly well. Her daddy's warm, whiskey-smelling body in the bed was familiar and comforting. Yep, it's all true, folks. Okay. She cuddled up to its strong protective warmth and felt safe and happy. He was a bear and she was so safe from harm. In the darkness, she heard his whispers. It was a thick Irish accent, not the clip British accent he put on at home in England. in England just touch me that's it he grabbed her little hand and illustrated the milking motion on his manhood not you can call it a manhood really I suppose pieces of shit like that there was that word again wanker it's what I am Nick thought carefully hating the movement Peter her brother had told her that she will she was a wanker now her father was making her do it I must be a wanker she thought to herself that's it oh Jesus that's good so it is Nick oh yes you're a lovely girl said her father who was a scumbag clearly but the crusade of rescue liked to give children to scumbags he lay back satiated thank you i sleep better now love he turned over and fell straight asleep nick lay with the moonlight streaming through the window and feeling dirty you would feel dirty because he was a piece of shit there was nowhere to go with the pain and the fear but inside of herself when she broke off from the part that felt the pain she woke up next morning somehow with that part of herself that her adoptive father had used so badly murdered it was dead it was dead. 
bright warm sun shone through the dusty windows of 23 the fort. It lit up dusty mantelpieces and grubby cream linoleum and sent sparkling white shafts of sunlight along the brown peeling wallpaper. Nick sat up and looked around her she was the same yet different it was like she had had surgery in the night an important part had been removed her ovaries or something something she needed to be a woman had been opened and removed she had been sewn up again to pretend it didn't ever happen but it did. Daddy had already risen early to put a bet on the horses. Nick, help me wash these dirty dishes. Auntie Frances shouted up to her, so she got out of bed and went downstairs. No, actually, she was out of bed already, wasn't she? So she possibly went downstairs. Frances was busy in the tiny kitchen washing up. White hair and thin lips, always smiling and slipping Nick bits of money. Daddy's mother, Teresa, was sitting by an unlit fire. She watched her in silence, trying to imagine what it was like to be blind. And dumb. She'd be dead soon, thought Nick, with the heartlessness of a child. It was late lazy late summer sunday morning and the house was cool and quiet mass was on the cards for the next hour and she was dreading it it was hollow and boring and hypocritical because daddy was a stinking pedophile sorry i'll add that in After the dishes were washed, she charged she bounced a small red ball against the wall out of the creaky push-up windows. Maybe I should do some sound effects there. Bump. 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 Out of the creaky push-up windows, she could see the centre of the green full of prickly gorse bushes and weeds surrounded by iron railings that the locals called the plantation. Some local boys had burnt some kittens in a cardboard box and they had all died. The neighbourhood had been shocked. Val Darling did it. I'm sure of it. The sick... Oh, gosh. This is my aunt, actually, Aunt France. She's dead now. She thought that Val Darling did it. I'm sure he didn't. Yeah. Oh, yes. Had to be the wonderful Val Darling. Val Darling did it. Aunt Frances had announced. Nick, I'm disgusted to see you attracted to evil. It'll be because you're one of them. Okay, I can't just have that sheet turned suddenly and Nick jumped. Okay. <sighs> to see. Sorry that you are attracted to evil. It'd be because you're one of them. She pursed her lips and looked at Nick up and down with a hard stare. One of them? You're illegitimate. Yeah. What was it? I always had that rubbed in, you know, like it was some kind of... Um, made me out. Sleaze bag, you know? I'm a sleaze bag. You're illegitimate. You're a sleaze bag. You're illegitimate. It's still happening now as well, you know, people trolling you. Oh, you think this, you fancy that one, you fancy this one, you're this, you're that. What the fuck? What is it, people? It's mainly women as well, or really, really effeminate men. I mean, could a real man ever troll? They don't, I'll tell you that much. Okay, Nick gasped her in shock and ran mortified back up the wooden, uncarpeted stairs as fast as she could. Yeah, I don't know that as fast as she could, it's kind of amateur. It felt as if everyone was ganging up on her, as if everyone was trolling her. It's trolling, yes. It's amazing how life never really changes. 
She looked out of the window. It was still early morning and the sun's warmth was not yet strong enough to heat up the chilly Dublin air. Milkmen had not yet finished their clunky morning manoeuvres. Val Dunning and some others were spinning around a fat girl with ginger hair. Who, 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 Christine, who Nick hated. This is all true, by the way. It's all my memories, but I'm calling it a novel, but it's all true. A fat girl with ginger hair who I absolutely hated, and she was called Marion. Okay, I, I've left that bit out. After mass, the family went to see Uncle Jerry, who was in the large Victorian mental home in the country. Daddy pushed his blind mother in a wheelchair. The large wheelchair would not fit on the pavement. So naughty daddy pushed his mother, his blind mother, along the busy main road like a nutter. Cars honked mercilessly at the slowness of him. Nick wondered if her adopted father was actually insane. His brother Jerry was in a schizophrenic, had been banged up in a secure mental home since he was a child, and so Maddis must have run in the, their dirty, stinking blood. Their dirty, stinking blood. Dirty. Stinking Irish blood. There, bastards. It's my revenge book. My revenge. Monday was a sunny bank holiday. Outside in the street, children were shouting and dogs were barking. Nick stayed in a lot in the cool front room with her father, her dirty, creepy father, watching television. She failed the wild Irish dogs in the plantation because they often bit her ass. Val Dunning was out in the street. She could hear him laughing, the gorgeous little Val. With his two big clothes and his dirty face, he fascinated her. And he still does. I hope you're out there, Val. I love you. I do. I love you. He was so very different from her own adopted brother, who was a pussy. Hope you're not listening, Michael, but no hard feelings. Who was a pussy who hated getting dirty and showed no interest in climbing trees like a real boy. No, he wasn't a real boy. He was a pussy. And he's a pussy now. And he hurt her with punches and prophecies of doom for her life. But she's ended up a writer with her own radio show that can talk about him to the day is long. So I got lovely revenge. Dunning was riding his push bike much too widely and fast. He flew off the middy hills in the late afternoon's weak sunlight and landed with a crash bravely on the pavement, giving him a blood-stained knee. Wasn't he a hero? He was my hero, I tell you that. He was my hero. He dismissed his injury with a wipe of his T-shirt. Oh, what a lad. His heart leapt for warmth of his strength and protection. Oh, to have a brother like that or a father was brave. And got a bloody knee and didn't give a shit. Nick gawked out of the window admiringly at Val and sat with a stinking pedophile adopted father. adopted father and watched the black and white afternoon matinee feeling dead inside. She knew not to make a noise it would upset her piss-stained mother. He was watching the TV set wrapped in a wing-back armchair, pulled too close to the small, dusty, poor television set. Because they were absolute losers. Nick observed his clean white vest, his platinum blonde stubble. She watched him more closely than she ever had before. He had a freshly lit cigarette in his right hand and tapped it into a nearby ashtray. He laughed crazily now and again. He laughed crazily now and again and seemed like a nutty, mean little spiteful kid. He had not been able to grow into a man who loved others. She noted that he felt safe and was contented. Felt safe and was contented here in his childhood home with his blind mother near in a way he never was in England because he was a piece of shit, pussy, pussy ass. 
Nick remembered something last night. Memories came in flashbacks, something large and private that she didn't want to see inserted inside of her. A large hand slapping her face and telling her to tell no one. She looked sideways at her dirty father. She knew that in his mind she was older and stronger. Older and stronger. And he resented her for that womanly strength because he was a creep of a man and a misogynist. In his childish envy, he wanted to break her with the emotional weight of pain and rape. To watch as she crashed and burned to affirm his dominance as a man. I'm getting angry when I'm writing this. <sighs> My darling fake daddy, thought Nick. How nice it would be if he was just a drop dead. How the world would be cleaner of him and his kind rapists. Rapists. Maybe some poison or a car accident. Her father suddenly became aware of the heat of her gaze and he stared back at her. At her. He grasped her look of murderous intent. He knew what she had remembered because he was a dirty piece of shit. Dad turned half away with a whiff of brute because he couldn't afford anything more expensive. Half amused and resumed watching the screen, Nick turned and took a long look out of the window. Outside the dirty glass, dirty glass, she could smell the sharp scent of lavender from the bush, pushed up against the polished pane, and watched Val as he shinned up the side of the muddy plantation, wet muddy plantation. Suddenly looked towards the window and Nick ducked down, terrified. His strong, kind brown eyes locked onto hers. For one moment, she was safe. She turned to look at her father, turned back and Val had vanished. He was taken by the rough scrub of the plantation. It was six o'clock and nearly tea time. Soon nightfall would come and it would be begin again, the splitting off of a part of her that was strong and saw everything was slowly being strangled. Her whole life as a Oh right, so anyway, that is chapter one of my book. And thanks very much for listening. And the title of it is Black Wings for a Bad Girl. And I haven't got an agent yet for it. And I won't get an agent for it because I haven't written it in a middle class fancy way that all the agents have to have. And then I won't get it published because... You have to write about it in a fancy, middle-class way. And last time I sent it to publishers, they were like, oh, your voice is too young. It's quite a childlike voice you've got, isn't it? So um, seemingly they haven't got an audience for someone with um, a childlike voice. So um, I'm not trying to write with a childlike voice. I'm trying to write um, as an adult. But uh, clearly nobody wants it. Never mind. Uh there we go. I am going to read on because I've got 10 minutes left. OK, chapter two. Nick was trying not to feel this is going on now a few months. Nick was trying not to feel an overpowering sense of seclusion as she overheard the sounds of laughter echo up from the street below her bedroom. She was 14 years old and she was okay. bored. She didn't trust people. They were hurtful when you least expected it. They didn't understand her. They couldn't reach her and she couldn't reach them. The list was endless, as was her resentments. Uh, hasn't changed. Other people seemed to have a manual for life and she had had her copy lost in the post. Nick failed her school exams deliberately and her mother's envy seemed to lessen. So she kept on despoiling her chances as if it made her home life more bearable if her mother wasn't jealous. Peter, who was less intelligent than her, hope you're listening, Michael, was praised unendingly for his schoolwork and she watched in silence as he basked in the glory that he did not deserve. Hope you're listening. Not 
Peter marched into her bed. Oh, God, can I read this out on air? <laughs> Probably not. I can't read the notes but out on her, Just leaving myself open for legal action. Uh, okay, let's scroll down. He left her and she picked up a book. She stayed put all morning under a du under a warm duvet. Oh, hang on, I gotta have night time, haven't we? She slept and there. Stayed put all morning under a warm duvet. Oh, hang on. Jesus. I can't have that because then I've got it night again. So okay. The darkening and quietening of the street below told her that she had idled away yet another day. She felt so alone she preferred to sleep through the days. A Greek studies book lay open on the floor beside the bed. Her tutor had been thrilled to tell her all about Greek myth, the mythical Persephone. The mythical Persephone, who had been kidnapped by a powerful Hades god of the underworld. She was held there and stayed with him until she was freed and stayed in darkness until she was freed. Oh, God. Shit. Mm. Nick. Oh. Oh, what is going on? Nick wondered what world could be more, what world could be darker than this one? Than this one. Got me. Nick looked up at the family's retriever as he nuzzled his way into her bedroom, padded across the floor and jumped up on the bed. His soft heart, her her heart leapt. Nogs, she cuddled him. He was her confident and comfort blanket. She leant against his soft fur. Oh, doggy. I didn't have a dog. I'm just adding that in because people like people with dogs. She leant against his soft fur with a scent of shampoo and picked up a book to read and picked up the book to read it. <clears throat> The illustration was of a blonde in a red dress being abducted and yanked down into the underworld by the mighty Hades. The dramatic oil painting was called Persephone, Persephone Rising. What an exceptional story, Nick, you onto a drowsy nog. She lazily tossed the book across the floor. <clears throat> across the floor as Nugget sleepily closed his eyes in the stuffy heat of the night. Both of us sleep through life if we can, don't we, boy? Nick told him as she gently scratched him between the ears. God, grandma. I wish I could have an adventure in a world not like this. I think I would make a good warrior like Persephone. She enthused. Yeah. Lengthening shadows threw themselves across the room and the air grew cooler. They lay totally still on the bed together. Her mood began to creep lower. She thought more profoundly about her own little life and how she would never find friendship or escape her family. Of pigs. Why aren't I happy? I'm a miserable bitch like me. No. They are pigs. How about that one? Pigs. Okay. <sighs> Nick. Nick stroked his furry body. Then turned over in bed when she realised he was fast asleep. Sleep. Unable to find a relaxing position on the sheet with his golden hulk taking up most of it, she lay awake thinking. Oh no. I can't have those thoughts. What will I do when I grow up? That's a thought, isn't it? What will I do when I grow up? Will 
I still live here? How can I when the men here want my body so much? Nick slept all night, then woke to a warm bedroom. Nogs had slept beside her. Nick ruffled his yellow fur and yanked back the duvet. A surprise no. A splinter of sunlight. A splinter of sunlight glinted across the window and lit up his lit up the gold in his fur. She twisted out of bed, her bare feet enjoying the softness of the carpet. She cherished her bedroom with its faded pink carpet and cheap wallpaper, with turquoise patterns and dark wooden furniture. The room smelled of sleepy dog fur and Lanthrop's apple soap on a rope. Nick peeked at the mirror hanging on the wall and took in her wide, sociable mouth, her overpale skin framed with its mousy bob. She ran her fingers through her uncombed hair and wished she had good looks so she could be a door, not a face that others wanted to punch. Was my real mother pretty, do you think? No. Oh, God. Shit, dialogue. Jesus. Oh, sorry, we've come to the end of the program. Thanks for listening to me read out my um, two chapters of my really crap book. And come back next week and I'll carry on reading. Thanks for listening. You can reach me on Facebook, Chris Joe Hart, H A R T. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Revolution Radio.